Corey, can you hear me? Perfect. Um, welcome to our fourth installment of the intern lecture series. Today, we're going to be talking about coronary artery disease. And because this is such an important and widely um, encountered disease process in medicine, um, we felt it was important to go through it today. So let's get started. Before we dive into it, I wanted to let you guys know that it was, it's okay to be wrong. Um, so often in conference, I blurted out the wrong answer or whatever was, was on my mind, and they still let me be a chief resident, so I encourage you to participate. Um, that's how we learn best is um, through our mistakes. So feel free to unmute at any point to participate or ask a question, and I have my chat open to send questions through that, and my co chiefs can help answer those as well. So today I wanted to cover these three objectives. First, will differentiate between stable ischemic heart disease versus ACS, which is acute coronary syndrome, in all kinds of practice settings. We'll understand the risk factors and diagnosis of stable ischemic heart disease. And then finally, we'll recognize acute coronary syndrome and learn what to do to act appropriately. As you can see in our objectives, I don't really have uh, a lot about treatment. And it's true, I'm not gonna talk about treatment today a lot, um, I just want you guys to, to have an illness script for this disease process and then get your seniors, your attendings, your CARDS fellows to help walk you through our different treatment strategies. So, um, you will encounter coronary artery disease in many settings, from the outpatient to the inpatient. And so today we're going to see a patient um, from his young age all the way through to ACS, and we'll see how we treat him um, with each of these steps. So let me read you this mix up question. Um, for now, I want you to file it away um, and we'll answer it at a later point in our talk today. So we have a 55 year old man who's evaluated for chest discomfort of several months duration. He describes the pain as sporadic left-sided chest heaviness for the last several minutes. His chest discomfort is generally, but not consistently, induced by exercise, and it's often, but not always, relieved by rest. He has some associated shortness of breath, but no other symptoms. Um, he remains active despite the pain, but is able to walk without limitations. His medical history is significant for hypertension, which is being treated. And so the question asks you what the most appropriate next step is. So like I said, we'll come back to this later. So file this away. So. Whenever you hear some patients say, I have chest pain, that should light some bulbs and get you guys activated to ask these three questions. Um, can anybody uh, unmute your mic and let me know what three questions we ask patients with chest pain to determine whether this pain is angina, meaning it is cardiac chest pain? or you can write it in the chat if you'd like. How about what does the pain feel like? What does the pain feel like? Yep, that's a good one. Not one of the ones I have listed here, but it's helpful to know the character of the pain. Great, uh, works with exertion relieved by rest. Absolutely, that's one. Where is it? Awesome, that's two. Yep, a lot of about what makes it better. How long it's been going on is a good one. Awesome, so I think we got them all now. So these are the three questions that we ask. We ask the patient where the pain is, and for cardiac chest pain, most commonly the pain should be substernal, so right in the center of the chest. And Alex, I know you brought up what does it feel like, so patients will often sort of point to the center of their chest or say there's an elephant sitting there or pressure in the middle of my chest. Great. You guys talked about what initiates or exacerbates the pain, um, and these are exertion or stress. Um, and if it's happening at rest, that's more concerning, but these are the things that make it worse. And you guys also brought up what alleviates or stops the pain, and that's rest or nitroglycerin. So great work. So if a patient meets all three of these criteria, then they have cardiac chest pain, and that's concerning, and that's what we're talking about today. 
So before we get a lot further into our talk, we're going to have a little activity. Um, and this activity will help us differentiate between stable ischemic heart disease, which is SIHD, versus acute coronary syndrome, which is ACS. So I'm going to leave this screen up for you guys and give you all four minutes to fill it out. And let me give you instructions on how we should fill this out today. So I want you guys to fill it out horizontally so that you're head-to-head -head comparing each of these disease processes. Um, and so the vessels, the circles are, are arteries, and I want you just to fill in how much of the vessel you think would be occluded in each of these diseases. Then next, I want you to move on to the biomarkers and tell me whether a biomarker is present or absent in each of these processes. And then think about the EKGs and whether there are EKG changes present or absent in each of these processes. And we'll come back in four minutes and we'll go through this together. If you guys are done much sooner than four minutes, just type in the chat that you're ready and then we can get going sooner. All right, you guys, it sounds like hopefully many of you have gone through most of this. It looks like VA Team A gave us some answers here. Great. Um, perfect. So let's go through this together. So you may ask me, well, Sanha, you didn't even tell us what the difference between stable ischemic heart disease and ACS is at baseline. How do I figure that out? So I want you guys to remember two hallmarks. So the first hallmark is that ACS means plaque rupture. 
And so all of these APS events, unstable angina and STEMI and STEMI, had a plaque that has ruptured and is now starting to occlude an artery. Stable cubic heart disease has a nice plaque with a, fibro with a plaque with a fibrotic cap and it's just sitting there. And then the second part I want you to remember is that ongoing chest pain is dying myocardium. And so anytime a patient is having ongoing chest pain, you should be on high alert and actively doing something about it. Great. So I thought team A gave us some answers. Um, is there somebody that has a mic and would like to try and uh, help me, and tell me what they've filled out for the vessels? Um, that would be awesome. Try your best. Okay, no worries. Um, I see that team A told us that for the vessels, stable ischemic heart disease is less than 50% blockage. Um, unstable angina is 50 to 70, and STEMI is 70 to 99, and STEMI is 100%. So you guys did a great job, super close. So the way I like to think about it is, you're right, I think you have the ranges pretty accurate. So in stable ischemic heart disease, like I said, there is a plaque with a fibrotic cap, um, and generally, I like to think about stable ischemic heart disease as 70 or below. As you guys know, autopsies show us that 10-year-olds um, start to get these plaques built up. And so um, the thought is, it isn't until 70% blocked artery is present that angina starts to occur because the vessel can't dilate any further to help increase oxygen supply. So I like to think about stable ischemic heart disease as around 70%. That's when patients start to get angina, but you guys are right, anything less than that would also be stable ischemic heart disease. And then NSTEMI and unstable angina can be any number, you guys are right, between 70 to 100. But we know that NSTEMI and unstable angina are defined by plaque rupture. And so there's some form of plaque rupture but the vessel is not completely occluded because that's what differentiates those two from a STEMI in which the vessel is completely 100% occluded and all three layers of the um, heart are now dying. Great. So um, is there anybody that would like to talk to us about biomarkers? I guess we can. Um, so for biomarkers, for SIHD, we said no biomarkers. Uh, in STEMI, plus biomarkers. UA, no biomarkers. In STEMI, or STEMI, plus biomarkers. Awesome. That is also what VA Team A said, and that is what I have as well. The only addition I have to that is, um, as you guys know, the name tells us the name NSEMI tells us a non-SC segment elevation MI. And so the hallmark of an NSEMI is EKG changes. Sometimes if it's early on, you may not see biomarkers, but you guys are absolutely right that most typically in an NSEMI, we do see biomarkers. So great work. Okay, and then lastly, we have EKGs. Um, so what about EKG changes? Thank you, Priscilla. We, I appreciate you guys participating. VA Team D, do you guys want to give this one a try? Uh, sure. So we said for SIHD, there would be no EKG changes. And we said for NSTEMI, you could have EKG changes. Um, STEMI, you would have EKG changes. And we said for unstable angina, you could or could not have EKG changes. Pretty similar to what the team A has said as well, and um, that's also what I have. Um, so stable ischemic heart disease, no EKG changes. And this, we're, we're posing that this patient hasn't had prior MIs, um, and they don't have any baseline EKG changes, but typically they have normal EKGs. And STEMI, like I said, the name tells you that that does have EKG changes, which are not an SC segment elevation. So T-wave inversions, SC depression, things like that. 
Um, unstable angina usually doesn't have EKG changes, but you guys are also right in that it can sometimes have EKG changes. Depending on the type, that might push you over into an end STEMI, so just watch out for that. Uh, but those two entities are pretty similar to each other, and we treat them exactly the same way. And then a STEMI, as the name tells you, has to have EKG changes, which are FCS segment elevations. I won't go into the criteria today, but um, there are certain ones. And so if you see any FC elevations or are concerned for FC elevations, just make sure that um, you're looking at the criteria to see if your patient meets them or not. Let's see, Eric tells us, biomarkers may or may not be checked in STEMI. They're not part of making the diagnosis. Yes, absolutely. So STEMI is diagnosed purely off of the EKG. Thank you, Eric. Um, and you guys, um, I don't have this in here either, but you must remember that um, troponin usually takes about three hours to start to rise after a patient um, has chest pain onset. That uh, number is getting lower now that we have these fancy high sensitivity troponins, but agree, um, you shouldn't rely super heavily on troponins if you're concerned that the patient has chest pain and EKG changes alone. So great. So just remember that ACS is plaque rupture, and I can't stress that enough. And then the second part of this is ongoing chest pain is dying myocardium. So awesome. I hope that that was helpful for you guys to try and categorize these things um, based on what they look like on paper. Uh, unstable angina is a difficult entity for us to identify and really relies on a patient's history of starting to get rest chest pain um, and you're concerned that they may have had a plaque rupture event. Um, and so you're going to be talking to a CAR fellow and your seniors to figure out what treatment plan you're going to take for those patients. Awesome. So um, it's your first day at someone's PCP and you're in clinic, you're seeing this 40 year old male, Mr. Hart. He's a lawyer. He smokes about half a pack a day. He runs twice per week. He has no complaints today, but he tells you that his dad had a heart attack at age 63, but is now doing okay. And in clinic today, his blood pressure was 140 over 82. And so he asks you, hey doc, how can you make sure that my heart is healthy? And you're looking at your papers, you're scurrying to your team room to staff this patient. And you ask your attending, well, what can we do? And so, <laughs> um, there are five risk, major risk factors that we think contribute to coronary artery disease, and to um, mitigate these risk factors helps us improve our heart health. And so I'm going to type in the chat feature what you think these five risk factors may be. I'll give you 30 seconds to see if y'all can get them all. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Mm-hmm. Nice. You guys are good. There's one more that you, oh, perfect. You guys got them. Excellent work. Okay. So this patient, we tell him, well, these are the things, the four things that you can modify and the one thing that you can't, but these are hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, smoking. And then the last one that I had listed here was family history, which um, the reason I put an asterisk is because it's a non-modifiable risk factor. And even if your family disinherits you, you still have their genes. So um, you got to go from there. And I think I saw a couple other ones, age and being a man, you guys are right. Those are um, things that increase the risk of the probability of you um, having coronary artery disease. So you tell your patient, these are the things that we can help you modify. Um, so I wanted to talk with you guys about um, this excellent tool that we often use. It's called the ASCVD Risk Calculator. And the reason I put a dot in front of the ASCVD is at um, Denver Health and University, ASCVD is a dot phrase. So if you just type dot ASCVD, that auto-populates the risk if the patient has all of these things measured before. Um, and so I put this patient's information in the calculator for you guys. Um, would anybody care to guess as to what this patient's ASCVD risk may be, which is his 10-year risk of having a cardiovascular event, heart attack, or stroke? Take a guess. Less than five. Okay. 
Yeah, it's hard to know, but I, you guys, VATMA kind of nailed it. So for this patient, his risk is only 3.8%. It also tells you that if you had optimal risk factors, it would be 0.6%, so you could be super healthy. Um, and it tells you that there's that no statin is recommended for him at this point. I wanted to send a quick reminder that it isn't just based on the ASCVD that we decide who gets a statin. Patients who have type 2 diabetes or LDL greater than 190 automatically get a statin or a risk of greater than 77.5%. Great, so this patient, you because he has hypertension, start him on antihypertensives, you tell him to quit smoking. Um, he doesn't have diabetes yet, but you tell him to improve his lifestyle, but he sounds like he's running twice a week. Um, and you send him back out in the community and tell him to follow up with you routinely, which he does. And then one day he comes back to clinic as a 55-year-old man. So I'm gonna ask you guys to open up your file cabinet and let's answer this question now, which was that he has been having some chest discomfort. It's sporadic, not really induced by exercise and not always really with rest. So it's sort of vague. Um, he is able to remain active and is walking without limitations. Um, he has hypertension, which we've been treating. And here's his EKG. Because it's so low quality, I'm gonna ask our EKG expert Expert Chief Dr. Verdoffer to give us his impression. Sorry, Sneha, did you want me to interpret the ECG? Yeah, I would love that. Okay, sorry, your audio cut out for a sec. Um, so it looks like a regular rate, um, pretty normal rate grossly. And then I'm looking at the rhythm and it looks like a normal sinus rhythm. I see an upright P wave in lead two. Um, and then let's go to the axis. It looks like a normal axis. We have upright QRSs in one, um, two, three, and AVF. And then I'm looking for, at my intervals, my QRS is narrow, the PR looks normal, QT is normal look, looking. And then we get to our ischemia. Um, and, and so, or um, hypertrophy. And so I see some overlapping QRSs, so I'm already thinking this might be LVH. And then if you count in V1, the depth of the F wave plus the height of V5 or V6, whichever is higher, um, if those equal 35 millimeters, then that's voltage criteria for LVH. So I don't really need to count to know that it's definitely going to meet that. And then for signs of ischemia, I see these T-wave inversions here in V4, V5, V6, V3 um, V also. And then the, here's like 1, 2, and AVL. So this person was, was asymptomatic. I, I think that the combination of LVH and um, the T-wave inversions would be consistent with left heart strain, um, from likely from LVH. Awesome, thank you. So um, for everybody, the takeaway from this is that this patient has LVH. So now we have a patient with this vague history, some chest pain, and LVH. So the question is, what is the most appropriate step? So if you guys, a couple minutes to chat with those around you and pick an answer. If you feel brave enough to put it in chat, go ahead and do it, take your guess, and uh, we'll go through what it is and how we got there. Okay, guys, the answer to this question is exercise, exercise stress echo. And if you didn't get it, that's okay. That's why you're here. If you did get it, awesome work. Um, let's go through how we got to this answer. So before we start that, we have a patient who's seen us in clinic who's having these chest pain symptoms, which sound somewhat concerning to us. 
but they don't sound all the way like this is slam dunk coronary artery disease because it's only sometimes released by rest or sometimes worsened by exertion. It's sort of this vague history, which happens quite often. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, um, in stable ischemic heart disease, who do we test? And when I say test, I mean who do we stress test? Um, so before we do that, um, I wanted to bring up this idea of pretest and post-test probabilities and how to interpret this graph which you can start building in your head each time you encounter a patient like this. And so just simplistically, you pick a pretest probability for this patient, and then you um, decide that if the test is positive, then the post-test probability is whatever it is up here on the positive test graph. Um, and so how this relates to coronary artery disease is we have a known curve for CAD, and here it is. And so if you look, if your pretest probability of coronary artery disease in a young person with no symptoms is, say, 2%, then even with a positive stress test, that probability doesn't really go up that much. It goes to, say, 5%. So maybe this is not the person that we do a stress test on. So it's not really going to help us. Similarly, if your pretest probability starts out at 65, 70, 80%, doing a stress test will only increase it to like 85 or by 20%. And so perhaps people in whom we start with higher pretest probabilities, we go straight to test, or we do some other tests that may help us uh, figure out what to do with those people. So the hallmark here, number one, hallmark number one is you test people that are in the intermediate pretest probability group. And so the example they've given here is a 45-year-old male with atypical chest pain, which I would argue that our patient is because his symptoms weren't super classic for cardiac chest pain. So he's somewhere in between with atypical chest pain, concerning enough that it may be coming from the heart. And so in him, the pretest probability is high enough that we would get a stress test. And if the test is positive, it will increase so much so that we may send him to calf or more aggressively treat him. The second hallmark that I wanted to talk about is how to test. And we won't belabor this too much, but often the ED admits patients with these intermediate heart scores, and you have to decide to stress test, the, stress test the patient in the inpatient setting, especially at the VA and Denver Health. So I want you guys to be somewhat well-versed in the um, terminology of this. So to do that, um, you have to understand this diagram, which is the ischemia cascade. And what that means is as the coronary blood flow decreases, different things happen in the myocardium. First, you start to see perfusion abnormalities. And then as we hop up the ladder, you start to see some wall motion abnormalities. And then EKG changes happen. And then last is angina, which is actively uh, dying myocardium. Because as I've been saying, chest pain is dying myocardium. And so we want to get here, but we don't want to keep patients here. So let's see how we answer this question. So to decide how, who and how we're going to stress test, we ask ourselves these three questions. First, we've decided this patient is intermediate probability of CAD, so I'm going to stress test them. And then you're going to try to figure out what kind of stress test do I need to order. There are so many options. So the first question you ask yourself is, can the patient exercise satisfactorily? And if we go back to our question, it tells us he remains active despite the pain and is able to walk without limitation. So the answer to that is yes, so we can exercise, which means we're going to pick an exercise stress test. Then the next question we ask is, is their EKG normal? So to remind you guys, his EKG is not normal. There are a few things that if exist on a baseline EKG, we cannot do an EKG stress test. And those are things like left bundle, LVH, baseline ST depression, um, and some other things that you can look up when you're deciding to order a stress test. Um, and then the last question we ask is optional, which is do I need imaging? And I think um, shortly I hope the answer of VAT teammates question that they asked about why is nuclear stress testing used so rarely? Um, and so in order to answer that, we'll talk a little bit more about the ischemic cascade and how we decide what we're going to use. So I wanted to show you guys this flow chart, which I think is super helpful. And if you guys have your phones, um, I'd encourage you to take a picture of it. So the way I look at it is 
Um, in this patient, we've already determined that question one tells me that I'm going to exercise him, so I'm starting in this right box. Um, I'm hoping to induce ischemia, um, and in him, I can't just look at EKG changes because his EKG is abnormal. So instead, I'm going to go here, and I'm going to look for regional wall motion abnormalities, and I'm going to go with an echo. The CMR is a cardiac MRI, which is an expensive, expensive test and difficult to do, so we don't often actually use it. Um, and then as you can see, the exercise stress test box also leads you down the path where you can look for perfusion defects by doing a nuclear stress test, which is an imaging portion of the stress test. And for team A, um, really it depends on your pretest probability, which is why I've been harping on that so much. And so as you can see in this um, ischemic cascade, you're right. Perfusion abnormality is some of the first changes we see. And so if you have a more, if you have a younger patient, fewer risk factors, a story that's quite vague, but you still think that they may have coronary artery disease, say because their lipids are abnormally high, or they had a parent who had a ischemic event at a really young age, um, I would choose to do perfusion testing. But really what we want to try and see is, can we identify an artery territory? And that's a lot easier to do if you can get them all the way up into the ischemic cascade. We want to try and put maximal stress on the heart to see if this stress induces a change. Um, and so quite frequently now, cardiologists have been adding the perfusion abnormalities um, because it's been easier to get. But I agree with you, it, it probably is underutilized. And Eric, I don't know if you had anything to add to that question specifically is why we um, underutilize perfusion testing. No, I, I think that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. So, so I hope that helped you guys understand why in that patient who can exercise but had an abnormal EKG, we decided to get a stress echo. We wanted to induce ischemia by making him exercise, and we wanted to catch any wall motion abnormalities to decide if he needed a cast where we would be most likely intervening. Cool. Okay, so um, the stress test is, uh, was fine. He didn't need any interventions. You maximally are treating his comorbidities. And he comes to you now as a 64-year-old man. He's in the emergency department. And you just happen to be the medicine attending years later. Um, he is now complaining of a one-week history of exertional chest pain. And three hours ago, that started as rest chest pain. During the evaluation in the emergency department, he had some V-fib. He was defibrillated, currently has ongoing chest pain. His history is significant for hyperlipidemia, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, tobacco use, and a stroke. He's on these medications. Um, his exam is significant for somewhat low blood pressure, tachycardia. He's setting 98% on four liters. He has some crackles on exam. And here's his EKG. I'll give you guys a second to look at it as a team. Maybe throw in the chat what you're seeing, or you guys can talk too. The O's is right. <laughs> Chest pain that started three hours ago and is still going on with this EKG. I think this one is important enough for somebody to walk me through it. So I would love if an intern walks me through this EKG. Otherwise, I'll. Okay, Zoolander is telling me that 2, 3, and AVS look bad. Okay, so I'm presuming, Zoolander, that you're talking about these FC elevations, which meets criteria that you're seeing in 2, 3, and AVS. When we see FC elevations, what is the immediate next thing we're going to look for? Mm 
nice reciprocal changes. Great work, DH work. And we see those in, they're subtle in here, but ADL is a little depressed here. Um, and the way these SDs are looking in one isn't great either. So now we're concerned that this patient is having what? Oh, I already saw. V18 is on top of it today. Thank you, guys. So this patient's having a STEMI. All right, what is the next best step? Great. PCI. So the reason we are incorporating these mix up questions um, is because they're supposed to be challenging. These questions are meant for our threes or older um, docs, uh, providers who are going to be taking their boards. So you have to be able to read the question, interpret an EKG, jump to a diagnosis, and then decide what your next best step is going to be. So these are supposed to be challenging, which is why we're going through them so step by step. And so that is the answer I also had, which was a PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention. Um, just to describe this, they snake a catheter up through your wrist or your groin all the way up into the heart. Um, they shoot a dye into all the major coronary arteries. They check out what's blocked by the CKG. They probably had a good indication of what was blocked. They sometimes do balloon angioplasties, different interventions. Ultimately, most of these patients come out with a stent. And so great work. Um, this patient had a PCI. So I wanted to just mention that everything we've covered so far really hinges upon the patient's history. And so I want you guys to always be harping on history, 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 anytime you're seeing a patient with chest pain. Um, and don't leave the room until you have a good idea of what their chest pain is doing, how it feels, what it feels like, like Alex mentioned earlier in our presentation. Where is it, which is really important. What makes it worse or what brings it on? And then what makes it better or what makes it go away? And really try to parse this out as much as you can because coronary artery disease um, and stable ischemic heart disease, ACS, whatever the process you want to talk about really hinges upon the patient's history. So just to review, we're going to ask these three questions. And if three of the three are present, even vaguely so, we're concerned that it may be a cardiac chest pain. And then if the pain is going on, if it started at rest or if it's ongoing, then we're worried that it might be acute coronary syndrome. And you guys are gonna immediately ask for help. You're gonna grab an EKG, a troponin, things that help you determine with what rapidity do I need to act upon this chest pain. Um, remember, act, ongoing chest pain is dying myocardium, so you gotta get this patient's chest pain down to zero. Not a one out of 10, not a two out of 10, not a little twinge. It has to be zero, meaning completely gone. Um, and if the patient is, if the pain isn't currently ongoing, then you can sit back, relax, and think about what kind of stress test you're gonna do um, and get help from your card fellow. Optimize their medication, mitigate their risk factors that we talked about already. So I said I wasn't gonna talk a lot about treatment. I wanted to just, mention treatment basics because I think it is important for you guys to know these words that once you start hearing them on the ward. So treatment basics for patients, this is for ACS. Everybody gets a full dose aspirin and then a daily aspirin 81. Uh, most people end up getting nitro, which is nitroglycerin, and you can dose that sublingually as a paste on the chest or as a drip. All patients get a beta blocker and then all patients get risk factor mitigation, so treatment for their diabetes, stop smoking, treatment for their hypertension, and treatment for their uh, lipids. And I forgot to mention all patients get a statin. I didn't write that here, but that's an important one. Um, patients that have a STEMI need to immediately go to the cath lab. And I'm sure you guys have heard door to balloon in 90, and that's still true. You try and open up that completely blocked artery, the 100% occlusion, as quickly as you can. And these patients will then be on DAP, which is dual antiplatelet therapy. And then patients that are having NSEMI or sorry, unstable angina should be UA. Those patients get a heparin drip. They 
get nitro, sometimes get put on nitro drip. And these patients have up to 24 to 48 hours to get to the cath lab, and your cardiology fellows will help decide when it's appropriate for these patients to go to the cath lab. This time frame is given that the patient is chest pain free. Remember, I keep saying ongoing chest pain is dying myocardium. And so if these patients are having chest pain, you need to figure out how you're going to get them to zero chest pain. And then if you can't, then they need to go to the cath lab sooner rather than later to get that blockage mechanically opened up. So since we have a little bit more time left, I wanted to bring it all the way back to um, what we talked about originally. And so now you guys know that single ischemic heart disease versus ACS are differentiated by the fact that in ACS there's plaque rupture. And again, ongoing chest pain is dying myocardium, so we want zero chest pain. You guys understood a little bit more about how and whom to stress test. And then when you recognize ACS, make sure that you're getting EKGs and components and asking for help if they're concerning. Um, and since I was a biochemistry major, I wanted to just throw this in here. I think it's helpful to bring, um, you know, the concept of bench to bedside. And so here it is. Um, I've gotten so used to hearing the word troponin over the last three years that I actually forgot what it was and where it came from. And troponin is a part of our um, actin myosin complex in our cardiac myocytes. And when there's a lack of oxygen supply, the cardiac myocyte can no longer do appropriate aerobic metabolism and starts dying. And when the cardiac myocyte dies, these parts are released into our bloodstream. And this is where the troponin comes from. The troponin is a trimer. One of the um, troponin T, I believe, is in both heart and skeletal muscle, which is why we use some of the troponin uh, isomers that are more uh, specific to the heart, to the cardiac myocyte. So just wanted to throw that in there so that we could be holistic doctors. So I wanted to see if you guys had any questions about this talk about heart disease in general. And then um, a reminder to my VA intern, we'll be meeting in G2104 at 1.30 for CPRS training.